Petit, uh, distinguished professor and eminent scientist. Uh, he is a full professor of operational operations management at the University of Texas at Dallas, USA, and also director of Center for Intelligence Supply Networks. On the other hand, he is a very uh, fruitful author with, I can say, amazing research records. Uh, since he was, he has written 11 books and published over 400 research papers in the field of manufacturing, operation management, finance, economics, marketing, and also optimization theory. Uh, he teaches a course on optimal control theory uh, applications and organize a seminar series on operation management topics. He also initiated and developed the doctoral programs in operation management at University of Texas, but also at and uh, at the University of Toronto. He serves on the editorial board of several journals, production and operation management, uh, science journal of control optimization, also uh, he was named the Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1994. On the other hand, two conferences were organized and two books edited in his honor in 2005 and 2006. Also, uh, there are some other honors uh, which include IEEE Fellow 2001, IFORS Fellow 2003, Triple A S Fellow of again 2003 Poms Fellow, IITB Distinguished uh, Alum in 2008 uh, Sam Fellow 2009, uh, also Alumni Achievement Award uh, Tepper School of Business Carnegie Mellon University 2015. Uh, his current research or recent research include uh, supply chain management. Uh, Partially observe inventory models, stochastic dynamic defense of games, and dynamic and stochastic advertising models. Uh, today, uh, we have pleasure uh, to listen soon uh, his talk about uh, the following topic: is a hierarchy of mixed leadership games for dynamic supply chains application to cost learning and uh, COP advertising. So I would like to invite uh, Professor Seti to uh, start with his presentation to give us uh, his talk. Please, Professor. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Milorad, uh, for that introduction. Um, Good evening to you guys, because I think you are probably already in the evening there. Uh, uh, as you already know, I'm a professor at University of Texas at Dallas. I would like to begin by thanking uh, again, uh, Professor Vidovich and also the conference organizers for this kind invitation. I was so much looking forward to being there myself. Uh, Partly because the last time I visited Belgrade was 1989. Oh. It was a Euro 10 conference. Mm -hmm. I remember staying at a Hilton hotel and I believe it was just a few years before Yugoslavia separated into different countries and, and you became Serbia now. And so, so I, really, I really think it was a long time ago and I really, uh, last year I had a, Fortune, fortune to visit uh, uh, Dubrovnik and also uh, Montenegro, which are not part of Serbia, but the, but the landscape is similar and the cuisine is similar. And I had a wonderful time going around uh, the country by car, uh, also Slovenia, but, but Serbia is, is in my future now. I, I probably want to come back uh, uh, to Serbia whenever there's an opportunity. Um, you know, right now with the pandemic, you know, all, all of us are sort of being confined into our, into our homes and, and I'm now coming, coming to you from my home, virtually. Uh, so let's, let's continue. So, uh, 
So I'm going to emphasize basically the aspect of Steckelberg games, dynamic Steckelberg games. And it turns out that much of the work in supply chain management is uh, devoted to single period problems. And so it was a few years ago I decided that I'm going to make the dynamic extension of the supply chain problems. And in the process, we learned a lot of things, including deriving some theoretical results in these kind of issues. And so what I want to do is to introduce gently, starting from the very beginning, uh, the aspect of these games, and then give two applications to, to you. One of them is going to be a problem in cost learning, which is a manufacturing problem in supply chain. And the other one will be a marketing channel. And the idea is to do something about cooperative advertising. And within that, there is a mixed leadership where the, the roles of the leader and, and follower are kind of mixed. And so we will, we will also get into that. So that's kind of the setup right now. Let's begin with a very simple supply chain. This supply chain consists of a supplier that sets the wholesale price to maximize the supplier's profit. And once the supplier sets the wholesale price, can you see my mouse here, by the way, everyone? Yep. Yeah, once the supplier sets the wholesale price, in response to that wholesale price, the retailer decides on order quantity. Is the volume okay? Everything, the sound volume is fine? Okay. Yeah, so everything so, is okay, yeah. Yeah, so I can increase the volume if necessary. Okay, so the, so the order quantity is in the response to the wholesale price. Turns out that each one, each of the agent is maximizing its own profit. And that does not always mean that the profit of the supply chain is maximized. So generally speaking, there is a difference between the supply chain profit and the supply chain profit, if it were to be a centralized, centralized entity, and the profit of the supplier and a retailer in a decentralized setting, that is what we are talking about. And that difference in the profit is called double marginalization. The reason it's called double marginalization is because the supplier puts up a margin on his cost of production. And the, the amount of margin he put is obviously one that maximizes his profit. The retailer puts a margin, which is the difference between the retail price and the wholesale price that he pays to the supplier. And again, that margin also is decided by the retailer to maximize his profit. And this situation is usually modeled as a Steckelberg game. And there is a whole lot of literature on static problems of this kind. So I'm gonna continue with the static setup for a while. Now, before we go into Steckelberg equilibrium, I want to give you a little bit of a uh, into last Nash equilibrium because it's much more popular uh, setting uh, and everybody kind of knows about it and everybody probably seen a movie called Beautiful Mind. Uh, so, so, so to begin with, in a game of two or more players, a set of decisions by the player is a Nash equilibrium if no player can do better by changing his decision while the other players stay with their decisions. The other way to look at it is that if, if a player can do better by changing his decision, knowing that the decision of the others, others are set in stone, then, the, then that set of decision is not an Nash equilibrium. Either way, you can decide they are kind of equivalent. So I'm just going to uh, start with a little clip of this, this, this uh, movie. Uh, let's see. There we go.
No, no. So in the movie, uh, Nash thanks the blind woman for his epiphany and goes home, write his masterpiece of 26 pages called Non-Cooperative Games, where he develops the concept of Nash equilibrium. And the four friends, I suppose, act on Nash's advice and they all choose the brunette women and do their decision forms in Nash equilibrium. Since it's a virtual seminar, I'm just gonna say, no, this is not a Nash equilibrium. Since each friend could gain by going for the blonde woman while the others stay with the brunette women. So the, the movie is about Nash equilibrium, but the, but the bar scene is not a Nash equilibrium. Any case, I am now going to create an example which is slightly simpler than a bar scene and then go through the difference between the Nash and the Steckelberg equilibrium. And also there are some issues that are kind of subtle. So let me just go. So here's, we're gonna restart with this one. We now consider a simpler version of the scene with two men, Tom and Dick, and two women, Emily and Linda. And both men prefer Emily to Linda, and no one gets any if any of, if they choose both, choose both the same girl. And of course, Either girl is preferable to no girl in this case. Now, when I was preparing this talk um, for, a, for a different audience, um, my daughter was with me and she says, you know, blonde and brunette is not politically correct, which was the, the movie, movie kind of thing. So I said, okay, I'm gonna name the men as Tom and Dick and women as, as Emily and Linda instead of making them blonde and, blonde and brunette. So here we go. So it turns out that if you look at the Nash equilibrium, there are two Nash equilibrium here. They are, they are all labeled in purple. The Tom chooses Emily and Dick chooses Linda as a Nash equilibrium. The Tom chooses Linda and Dick chooses Emily is also a Nash equilibrium. So in the, in the first equilibrium, you can see if Tom deviates by going for Linda, he suffers by getting none. Likewise, if Dick deviates by going for family, he suffers the same fate. So there is a Nash equilibrium. Same, same argument holds for the second equilibrium. So this is kind of the setup for Nash equilibrium. Now let's go to the Sekelberg equilibrium. This was put forward initially by a man named Sekelberg. And he, 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 it's interesting to note that this particular game was invented or just was put forward by Sekelberg in 1934, which is quite, quite a few years before Nash's, uh, Nash's thesis. But anyway, uh, we're gonna continue. So, so there are also, other two books that I mentioned, which are 
classic in, in the game theory, both by one by John von, My von Neumann and other one is von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern. If we have time, I'll tell you a little bit story about the von Neumann Morgenstern book uh, that my professor uh, told me. Uh, he, he worked with Morgenstern himself, so he gives me the story, but let's, let's continue on. So now we will have Tom as a leader and Dick as a follower. And now the game becomes a sequential game and it is solved by, by backward induction. So by, by that we mean that we first obtain the best response function by Dick for each action by Tom. So that response is gonna be given as a function. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna see all the functions that, that Dick has at disposal. He has a function called given by this table here. So function of Emily is Linda, function of Linda is Emily. That means that if Tom chooses Emily, Dick chooses Linda. If Dick, Tom chooses Linda, Dick chooses Emily. That's a function. Another function is this one, yellow. Function of Emily is Emily, function of Linda is also Emily. Another one is this one, another one is this one. It's very clear that the optimal response function for Dick is purple. So that is the, so, so that is the function that the Dick is gonna choose. And Tom knows that that's a function he's gonna choose because that's how you solve the backward induction problem. So Tom is gonna choose Emily. So the only Nash equilibrium here is a purple equilibrium, which is gonna be Tom, Emily, and Dick Linda. So what happens here is if Tom deviates from Tom, Emily to Linda, given that the response of the response function of Dick is purple, then he loses. On the other hand, if Dick changes his response from purple to yellow or blue or gray, given that Tom has chosen Emily, then Dick also loses or stays the same. So you may have caught the difference here that, 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 that was between Nash and, 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 and Stekelberg, but I will go to the next slide. The obvious difference is that a Nash involves a simultaneous decision and the Stekelberg involves a sequential decision. It's also clear that the Tom has a first mover advantage here because in, in Stekelberg game, he gets Emily, whereas in, in a Nash game, he could also get Linda. We, we are not talking about how one gets to the equilibrium. We're only talking about what the equilibriums are at this point. That's not our purpose now to decide how one gets there. That's an entirely different, uh, the, the literature and economics about that, but we, we don't want to, this, that's not where we want to go right now. There is a difference now, subtle difference is like this. If you want to check the Nash equilibrium, then the Dick's deviation for checking that is changing his action. His action is going from the woman in the equilibrium to another one. That's in the Nash equilibrium. On the other hand, if you want to check the Stekelberg equilibrium, then the Dick's deviation is not going from one woman to another. Dick's deviation is going from one response function to another response function. So the space of deviation changes. The Nash equilibrium can be defined simply by, the Nash and Sekulver equilibrium can be defined simply by changing the space of deviations, okay? There's another less well-known difference when, uh, when it comes to dynamic games, and I will talk about that in slide 24. A lot of people do not know that particular difference, but it will come to, come to us in slide 24. I'll tell you about that later. Now, when we get to dynamic problems, so this is where, so, so far what we have done is to decide, you know, get some differences between the Nash and the Stekelberg equilibrium. Now we're gonna to go to the dynamic equilibrium. The dynamic equilibrium in Stekelberg variety, there may be many different def ways to define. And this depends on what is called the information structure of the game. While there are many, many, there are a number of such equilibria, and I have a paper in Siam Journal of Control in 2015, which will be cited later, where we actually talk about many of these other equilibria. But in this talk, I'm gonna talk about only two equilibria. One of them is called open loop solution. The open loop solution, what we do is, supplier will announce the wholesale price in period one and period two, at the same time, at the beginning of the game. And the retailer's best response takes both of these prices into account. So in theory, in practice, in theory, retailers first period order quantity can depend on the wholesale price of period one and period two, because he knows both of them right away in the beginning. So that's first thing that can happen, which does not happen in, in the next equilibrium I'm gonna talk about. 
The second thing is leader continues to have the first mover advantage in this, in this setting. The third thing is the solution does not take into account the realization of the demand in period one. So whatever uncertainty was there in period one, that uncertainty gets resolved with the beginning, by the beginning of period two. That uncertainty is not taken into account because everybody has already made their decision. And the drawback then is the solution is not time consistent. That means if I were to solve the problem in the second period, the decision I made in the first period may no longer be optimal. Okay. And, and of course that, that can generalize to multi-period problems as well, not just two period. I'm just gonna do two period, but I will define the, the equilibria for multiple setting, multiple period setting. And in this kind of game, there is an important idea is that the, these, there has to be a commitment. So once I decide, once the supplier decides W1, W2, which are the two wholesale prices, he cannot change. He has to make a commitment. And the only way, so the, in economics, we call them games with commitment. And right now there are a lot of things that, 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 that go on in this setting, which if you have time, we can talk about it later. But generally speaking, the games of commitment require a court to enforce this thing because if somebody deviates, then somebody has to sue somebody and the court has to enforce these, there are penalties. So it becomes a lot, lot more complicated because it's not time consistent. So I'm, interested in a time consistent setting because I'm trying to ge generalize the supply chain static setting to dynamic setting and I'm trying to propose something as what to do. So here's the feedback Stekelberg setting. Here the supplier announces only the first period wholesale price at the beginning of period one. Of course in announcing that he has to take into account somehow anticipate what is going to happen in the second period and we'll talk about that later how, we, how you accomplish that. Then in period two, in period two, the supplier announces the second period of wholesale price. After observing the realization of the uncertainty that gets resolved, demand or whatever it is gonna be. Retailer responds to the supplier's wholesale price period wise. Okay, so period wise means in period one, is his response is a function of period one order quantity in period two is a function of period two order quantity. Both of them take into account the state observed in period one, at the end of the period one. So everybody knows of the state of the system. It's a full information game. And the solution is time consistent, which is important here. And the drawback is that the leader only has a stage-wise or period-wise uh, first mover advantage. Leader does not have a global first mover advantage in general, okay? But it wouldn't matter to us because once we do the feedback, we will, we will do what is called a coordination. And, and so we will achieve the, 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 the best solution in any case, even though this, this, this advantage may be just period wise. So the first paper that I'm gonna present is, is, a, is a 2015 paper, and that is a two period problem. I'm gonna, and the next one will be the mixed equilibrium, which is a, which is a paper we actually published just last year. So here there is a cost of production in the second period, it declines depending on how much you produce in the first period. So more you produce in the first period, you learn more about how to produce things. And in the second period, your cost of production goes down. So there is a learning going on and that learning is gonna be stochastic. So very quickly, I don't wanna to spend too much time uh, on this because this is a literature that, that is, is vast and there's something called learning curve or experience curve or learning by doing. The first paper in this area was published by a man named Wright. It's not the Wright brothers Wright, even though there is a picture of the aeroplane here. Uh, the direct, the, that 1936 paper, they observed that the direct labor costs of manufacturing an airframe fell by 20% with every doubling of the cumulative production. That you will learn how to learn, how to produce these things more efficiently. So there could be labor efficiency, better use of equipment, production process can be improved over time, a shared experience effects, and a lot of things that can go on in order to do that. For our purposes, all we need to know is that the, there's a learning effect. The learning effect is dynamic. It takes over time, a period of time, and is stochastic. 
Empirically, the rate at which the observed costs decline tend to vary widely, both across and within industries, and even across departments within a firm. And particularly true for the production of new product where you're still learning, like when the, when the semiconductors were being produced in the beginning, the cost of producing semiconductor was going down quite rapidly because people were learning about how to produce them more efficiently. So in a two-period problem, let's see what is a centralized problem. First, in the presence of learning, centralized channel, there's a monopolist manufacturer and he or she can learn by producing more in the first period and reduce the cost in the second period. And the demand is price dependent in our model. So clearly the optimal production quality in each period has to be their decision. It is conceivable to say that he will overproduce initially, which means the optimal price in the, in the first period may be lower than what it would be otherwise so that, that there will be high demand, high demand will high production, and that will reduce the cost of, cost of production in the next period. So the overall two period optimality may require some suboptimality in the first period in order to gain in the second period, okay? So here, basically the decisions are price and production, and you can reduce the price and to increase the demand, that increased production will give you more learning, more learning will give you a lower future production cost. When you go to decentralized setting, however, it's more complicated. First of all, the price is set by retailer because he's the one who's gonna selling, selling the product to the consumers. So we're gonna have a, the manufacturer will decide on wholesale price and production quantity, and the retailer will decide on retail price and ordering quantity. So this is our setting here. Learning experience takes place here on this side and the retailer sells to the market, okay. Now, turns out that generally speaking, we know in a single period setting that the retailer actually do high price. And that is the, that is the reason for double marginalization is in a single period setting, because the high price the retailer charges is for, for, for maximizing his profit, but that high price hurts the demand. And, as, and so it hurts the manufacturer's profit in some way. That's where we will get to cooperative advertising later, but, but this is what happens. So, so the double marginalization actually here with the learning will be more severe than in the single period setting. And because it's gonna be more severe, there will be, a, there will be a necessity of what is called coordination. Coordination means finding a contract such that, that the decentralized decision-making under the contract will act as if it was a centralized decision. That means it will make the same profit as if it was a centralized company. They will still be behaving in a decentralized manner, but under the contract. And such a contract is called coordinating contract. And we will actually do a coordinating contract in this, in this, mo in this model. The paper has uh, a two period model setup. We'll give some assumptions, which are kind of innocuous, uh, can be extended. And we will do no inventory option means that the manufacturer, or the retailer will not carry any inventory in the first period to sell in the second period. There is a, another one in the paper, which is when in fact manufacturer carries the inventory. And there's a third one that is still working, going on, ongoing work, which was not published earlier, is when, the, when both of them can carry inventory. But those are more technically, more advanced, but conceptually, all that we want to learn today is enough for this no inventory option. It is the most, it's the simplest of the three, and I'm not going to go beyond 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 that in this in this talk. Okay. The first period is because of the infant stage. That's where all the learning takes place in this model. The second period is called a mature stage, where it's, there's no learning. It's only a two-period problem. And, and there are a number of people, including the few Nobel laureates, here's a Nobel laureate, here's a Nobel laureate. They have written basically the same idea that there's a first period, second period, learning takes place in the first period. So, so we are in some sense, literature wise, we are on good ground. Our model will have a, a demand function. So the demand function will be AI minus B times PI, 
which is a linear demand, it's decreasing with price. AI is a market potential, which means if the price is set zero, that is, that's the market we're gonna sell. B is the price sensitivity. I'm not gonna call it elasticity because that's a little bit more technical, but in our purposes, it's just the sensitivity to the price. And the PI is the retail price in period, period I. WI is the wholesale price in period I. So this is the demand parameters. Cost, C1 will be the cost of production in period one. C2 will be the random cost of production in period two. And the small C2 will be the realized cost of production in period two that we will know at the beginning of period two. Lambda is the learning rate, which is a random variable. Decision variables QI will be the retailer's order quantity in period one, period I, and BQI will be the manufacturer's production quantity in period I. Okay, we already have the WI and PI, the other decisions here. So there will be these four decisions, two and two decisions by each party. So here's how this works. Everybody knows the initial cost of production. Based on that, the manufacturer will decide the wholesale price and how much to produce. Once he decides, the retailer will react and in the response decide the retail price and how much to order. All of that happens, the, inf the, the learning takes place. After learning takes place, everybody, the C2 will be realized as small C2. So everybody knows C2. That's the state of the system. Given that, they will, manufacturer will decide W2, Q2, and the retailer will decide P2, Q2. And then that basically game is over, okay? So here's, here's a summary of all of that that we talked about. DI in, in, in period I is AI minus B times PI. B could be made a function of I also, but it is not necessary for purpose of this, 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 this talk. It only creates one more, one more variable, one more parameter, which is not necessary. The state equation is C2, which is the cost in second period, will be C1 minus lambda times how much you produce. So lambda is the learning rate. It's a random variable that takes value between zero and gamma. In general, you will need a distribution of lambda, but for this particular problem, because the simplified objective function, everything, it turns out that you only need mu and sigma. Then now you don't need any other parameter of the distribution. Okay. The manufacturer will not, may have an option of inventory, but we will not assume that in this model, in this presentation rather. Back orders are not allowed. That means that we cannot backlog the demand. Uh, both are forward looking, which means that they don't, they don't do myopic decision making. That means in period one, you don't worry about it. What happens in period two? They all worry about what happens in period two. These are decisions which are simply to make the, 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 the cost and the demand non-negative. If you don't have this assumption, you have to put a max comma zero, and then it creates some corner solutions, but it is, it is not a difficult thing to do. It just makes it more messy. So I'm not gonna talk about these assumptions. So the centralized problem is very simple. It's just a two period dynamic programming problem. You can sort of see that maximization is done on this, this function. So you can see this is price in period one. This is the sale because the sale will be the lesser of the two demand and the, the total production quantity. You cannot sell more than what, you, what, you, what the demand is. So that's your revenue. The cost will be C1 times what you produce. So that will be your cost. Second period will be the same thing except the C2 is random variable. So it'll be a capital C2 and you are maximizing here. And because of this random variable, you will have an e expected value outside. And you solve backward. You solve the two period, second period, then the first period, and it's a straightforward. So you can sort of see that you can decide exactly uh, this is the solution. It's a closed form solution. Price in period one is P1, P1 star is given by this formula. How much you produce is given by this formula. And then second period price is based on the C2 because you observe the C2. Everything is a function of the state in a feedback solution. So the dynamic programming is also time consistent. So we have, we have no problem here. And so we have the entire solution here. And there is a total profit also given by of the centralized problem. The centralized problem is dynamic programming. How are we doing time-wise? Oh. Okay. So, now we do decentralized problem. So decentralized problem, there's a profit of the manufacturer. It will depend on all the variables. So we put everything in there. And 
that profit in our setting, this is general, in our setting it will be because the manufacturer only gets wholesale price times what he sells, not what he produces, but he sells. But the cost is what he produces. So this is his revenue minus cost, and that's the second period is a revenue minus cost. So the objective function of the manufacturer is given to be slightly different than the previous one. And for the retailer, the profit is gonna be again the revenue, which is this one, but it, that, that will be Q1 now. And, and this, the cost will be not C1, Q1, but W1, Q1, because he's, that's what he's paying to the, to, the, to the wholesaler, to the manufacturer. So these are the objective function. The state equation will be shared by both of them. And so the production cost is the state variable. These are the decision variables. So this is the setup. This is an important slide. Here I'm gonna define what is the Stackelberg equilibrium. And I will also tell you that we have developed verification theorems that will tell you that, 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 that we achieve the equilibrium. I'll talk about that later. So in a feedback cycle equilibrium in an n, n period problem, the state of the system is X and another state you can call it is a time T. So at any given time T and given the state X at that time, the leader, in this case, I decide leader because this is a general setting. So the leader will decide a decision, which is a feedback form, it will be denoted as U of X comma T. The follower will take that into account. So the follower decision V will be, again, the function of the state and the time T and that control. Notice this is not coming as a function here. It is not U dot T. It's not a feedback function in a feedback cycle vehicle. It will only react to the, the output of this decision, which is U of X comma T, okay? So in a, so the leader strategy will be UX1, UX2, UX. We'll write that as a, that a U, U will be this vector. And V will be the vector for V. So this will be V of X1, X1, U. This, all of it is notation here, nothing more. But notation is very important in, in, in defining this. So, so this is V, so you got all of that. Now we let U and V the space of strategies. If there are other constraints, you can impose those constraints in, in all, on those decisions, U and V. But once you decide, these are the feasible spaces. Big U and a big V are the space from which the U and V will be drawn. Now, once you select U and a V, any feasible U and a V, I need to, 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 to do the dynamics. So dynamics is given by this, xi plus one, which is the state in period i plus one, is a state in period i plus some function. You can also put this in inside it, that's okay too. It doesn't, it doesn't make that much difference. But I leave it this way. And so this is your state. And when you solve this problem from any given time t, remember it's gonna be time consistent. So you can define from any given time t rather than the beginning time zero, so we, or one. So we define at any time t, any time t, the initial condition is y, this any, any condition that we will find ourselves because it's a stochastic problem. We'll observe that and that's, your, that's a state y. And given that, I want to solve the state equation for period t, t plus one all the way to n, given a feasible u and a v. When I solve that equation, I will get a solution. The solution will be denoted like this. In period i, I going to t to t n plus one because they, that when I goes to t I goes to n this there's a, there's a state called n plus one, so this is the state given the initial condition t and y in period i given the feasible decision u and v, so that notation says given u and v given the initial condition how the state will evolve over over these periods i from t plus one to n. Okay, once we have the state, <clears throat> given that we have this notation here, this notation, we can define the, the objective function of each of the character here, each of the agent. The, so the, the leader's objective function will depend on X. So this is, a, this is a period I, I'm gonna sum the profit in each period from I to N. So I'm gonna only give, define the period, profit in period I. The profit in period I will depend on the state in period I, the leader's decision in period I, the followers this in period i and a period i and then in a variable lambda i. 
And there's a salvage value, which depends on the state, which we leave at the end of the end period. The ending n is given as the beginning and n plus one where the problem ends. Similarly, we have a follower subjective function, which is the same in the arguments are the same, only the function is defined differently here. So we have the both functions. <clears throat> Once we have both functions, we can define the feedback stack of like equilibrium. This is how we define it. Given u star u and a v star in v, that's called the feedback equilibrium if the following two inequalities hold. So maximization, you need one equality. Equilibrium for two agents, you need two inequalities. So, and these are kind of Nash type inequalities. So you will see what's going on here. So the first inequality is for the leader. So leaders, this is the leader's decision profit in, in, in what we call equilibrium. If it deviates from u star to u, while the follower stays with his response v star, which is the response here, then he loses. So you can see that the equilibrium profit is bigger than the profit when u star goes to u. u is any other, any other point, any other decision in u. So this is u here, this is u here. And you see for all u and u, this inequality holds. Look at what happens to the follower. Remember the follower now deviates not from the woman to the woman, it deviates to the response function. So followers deviate from a response V star to response V. But the leader stays at U star. So now you can see that the followers objective function also, so when you change from V star to V, you also lose for all V and V, which are the decision spaces. So all V and V we lose. So we define NAS, all we change, if I change this V to, to similar to Nash, this, this will define Nash equilibrium as well. But I have to change the definition of V. It will be similar to U. And here I, I'm on slide 24. So I told you there's one more difference between Nash and Steckelberg, and that is important difference for, for, for people going into this field is that if I were to define Steckelberg equilibrium in a single period setting as Steckelberg had it in his book, then I can actually define the second inequality without star here. That equality is good for all u and all v because the response function is optimized for each u. So I can change u as well. But that particular change cannot be done when you, when you do the dynamic extension of the Steckelberg. Okay, so for the dynamic external equilibrium, I cannot change this u star to u. I can do it on the open loop because open loop is a single period problem. Everything is decided at the beginning. So mathematically open loop is a dynamic problem, but mathematically it's a single period problem. So any single period problem, I can replace this u star by u. So open loop, I can do it, but not in the feedback. So this is the, the slide that I mentioned. Once you have, you can do the backward induction and you can solve this completely in closed form. So we have solved that in the paper. I do want to mention that in the paper that I'm gonna present now, after this one, we do a verification theorem. The verification theorem says that if I can do this dynamic programming backward, then the solution is an equilibrium. We don't talk, we cannot say it is the only equilibrium, but it is, it is an equilibrium and a Steckelberg equilibrium. So that's all we can do right now. We, 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 the, the uniqueness is, is, is a really difficult, difficult thing to prove here. So most of the literature will basically give you an equilibrium and say, okay, we don't know if it's unique, but this is an equilibrium. So I will, <clears throat> because there's a double marginalization, I'm gonna do a, a coordinating contract very quickly. Um, Okay, uh, we got we got running short of time a little bit, so so I'm going to run run through very quickly. There are two kinds of contract which are generally there are many other, but we're going to talk about revenue sharing contract in which the revenue is shared between the two parties. Okay, so so a, a, such a contract will be like this: W one C one is the wholesale price of of, of the of, of the retailer. Phi one is the retailer's share of the revenue. W2 is the wholesale price in the second period and phi2 is the retailer share of the revenue. Such a contract is called a revenue sharing contract. And if I can define phi1 and phi2 in, in a way so that this contract becomes a specific contract, 
I can define, I can show that I can define five and five two in such a way that this contract will lead to, will be a coordinating contract and will lead to the profit, which will be exactly the profit of the centralized, centralized supply chain. Okay, if both companies were together. So here's the, here is the, here's the result. First of all, you can see that the, the, the objective function that of, the, of the retailer is now different because it is, it is five one times the revenue, the total revenue, which is all he receives. The other, other guy receives one minus five one. So this is the, re the revenue minus the cost plus the revenue minus the cost. And so this is, this is received by, by this guy and the other guy receives the other one minus five one and the wholesale price profit. So you can easily write the other. So these are the ob objective function and we show the following. For any five one five two in zero one, which is a proportion of the profit, if I set W1 to be this quantity and a W2 to be this quantity, then this is a coordinating contract. That means the profit will be centralized profit. So this is closed form solution. We also show that this formula of the second wholesale price is the same formula that is derived in the literature for a single period problem. After all, the second period problem is a single period problem, right? So the second period problem, all the results will be what it would be already established in the literature. But the first period is this is a new result in 2015, okay? This one I'm not gonna present. It is a paper that was presented in, uh, in Malta in, in, in uh, July, also done virtually because I could not travel to Malta in July as well. But, but, but the next one that I'm gonna present is more general than this. So we're just gonna skip this guy. We are gonna talk about cooperative, we're gonna talk about cooperative advertising and then we'll go to the next paper, the mixed equilibrium. What is a cooperative advertising? It is an arrangement by the manufacturer pays some or part of the cost of advertising of the retailer. And the reason the manufacturer pays is because if, if manufacturer doesn't pay, then the retailer doesn't advertise enough. And when doesn't advertise enough, the demand will be too low and the demand is too low will hurt the manufacturer. So the idea of cooperative advertising is like this. I'm gonna go fast on this one. There's a lot of literature and marketing on this. The participants will raise the percentage, percentage that the manufacturer provides to the retailer. Here are the various, well, if you look at the 5 billion, 5 billion cooperative advertising expended in 1987 in the United States, it was 15 billion in 2000, it was 2000. It was forecasted to be 25 billion in 2007. I don't have the data for now, but it will be way more than 25 billion. Uh, there's a literature saying average participant rate is 75% by marketing people. Uh, here are some industry specific particip participation rates. So the participation rate is quite huge and it is, it is, it is a good instrument in marketing that, that manufacturers use to increase their demand. And there are surveys of cooperative advertising. There's a survey in 2015 in Euro, EJOR, another survey in EJOR, our survey also in POM. So there are a number of, number of number of uh, papers. IBM, for example, <clears throat> gave a 50% 50, 50 of the advertising cost, Nature Bounty 50%, Apple 75%. So one could ask, what is the participation rate in a given setting? And our model would answer that if you have the data. So I'm gonna skip that. This is a game between two retailers and one manufacturer. I'm gonna skip that. It's, it's, it's uh... so I'm gonna come to here. This paper is published last year in Science Journal of Control. As you can see here, uh, it is done with uh, Anna Ben Susang, who is a, a colleague of mine. Uh, he's an expert on stochastic control, a former student of mine who works for Target. And Suman Chutani works uh, as a professor in UK. And these two guys are professors in Hong Kong. So it's a multi multinational paper, actually. Okay. So, <clears throat> This is the outline of the paper. The static game is a one factor, one retailer. There's a double modulation, there's a contract theory. We already talked about the equilibrium concept. And now we're gonna say what is the equilibrium. And, and the, the, the equilibrium, the mixed leadership is almost the same. It can be defined in a similar way. And the verification theorem, which is the sufficiency condition is proved in this paper in 2019. So we can use that theorem to, to, to say that what we got in equilibrium. Very quick on the literature. There's a deterministic case uh, by Papa Vasilo Pulos and Cruz. This is a professor that we got in touch with eventually because we were, we were extending his paper. Um, 
okay, and this is our paper in Siam control. Then there's a feedback information structure was actually was devised as early as Seaman and Cruz, 1973 in discrete time. Continuous time came, there's a book by Basar and Huri, which is a well-known book as well. And, and they said that, well, you can take the limit of discrete time, you get a continuous time, but, but they said that we don't know how to take the limit. And that, that, stayed, that stayed open, problem stayed open. We did the continuous time without worrying about the limit. We went directly to the continuous time and we, we developed the sufficiency condition for what is called a feedback cycle-break equilibrium. So that's where as far as I go on this one. Uh, so we'll go to the mixed leadership means that each player has both leading and following strategy. So the equilibrium becomes Teckelberg and Lash. Okay, but that's the extension is straightforward. What I'm going to do is to go into the application now. So the application is as follows. There's a manufacturer, there's a retailer. And this is the participation rate of the manufacturer. This is the participation rate of the retailer. And once the participant rates are given, these are the actual advertising expenditure by the retailer and the manufacturer. So here both people advertise and both are being supported by others in some way, okay? Uh, now, you can sort of see that this is a special case of four, four, four companies. These could be two companies and these could be two companies. And so, but this company is the same as this company, this company is the same as this company. So it is a special case of the four companies. So you can actually think about, a, our paper does into that and then talks about this. Okay, so that's, that's our setting. The model that we use, this is the market share. This is the, the market share of the total, total potential market. And this market share depends on, and this is a model that I proposed in 1983. This is a slight extension of that model. That, that, that model has gone quite far in the sense that there are at least 50 or more papers based on the SETI model right now. It is also has its presence in Wikipedia. So one can go there and look at the, the, some of the literature that is, that is followed uh, following SETI. Uh, the SETI model was, was Brownian motion as well there. So it was the Ito stochastic differential equation. So now we have uh, advertising and this is, the, this is the proportion of people who are not buying. So we are, we are talking, the advertising affects the people who are not buying the product. It's preaching not the choir, but the preaching what is not the choir, okay? And there is a depreciation of that, that if you don't advertise. So that is your drift. And then there is a Brownian motion term, which is a noise in the system. And there is an objective function here. You see, this is the revenue obtained by the manufacturer, that's M times X. And this is the cost. The manufacturer supports the retailer's advertising expenditure. The advertising expenditure is, 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 a, is a cost, is, is convex because the advertising has a diminishing effect. So we, we assume the convex cost. So this is the amount of money that's, that is paid by the manufacturer to support the advertising of the retailer. But, but the retailer pays that, but his advertising. So that is the manufacturer advertising, the retailer pays, retailer pays UR, so, so, so this guy pays one minus UR, okay? So this is the total profit. The retailer the same way, his revenue is R times X, which is the market. And, and he has to pay, he has to pay, he has to pay, some money uh, to, 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 to manufacture, and he also pays some money to his own advertiser. So that is the objective function. Let's continue on quickly. The game is played at the Hamiltonian level. So at each time T, we have a Hamiltonian, and a static game is played at each time T. And it is somehow weaved into a dynamic setting of some kind of a dynamic programming, okay? But the game is played at each time T, okay? So that's a Hamiltonian of the manufacturer. The Hamiltonian of the manufacturer is integrand plus the shadow price, which is the adjoint variable times the dynamics. Uh, shadow price again and the dynamics. And these are the leading decision, which is the red one. These are the following decision, which was the, which are the blue ones. And we are going to optimize the Hamiltonian because we are playing the game at time t. So when we optimize the Hamiltonian, we take the first order condition of these and we get the response function VM of the manufacturer and the response function VR of the retailer. Because remember, they are also follower of the other decision. So if for each decision, somebody is a follower, somebody is a leader. So these are the following decisions. 
and the following decisions are the function of the leading decision which are given by the red quantities. Okay, we we put those into the Hamiltonian. We get the next Hamiltonian. Okay, and this so this is backward induction now. So now once the retailer's objective uh, response function is weaved into this, then the manufacturer maximizes the Hamiltonian for U M. And, and a retailer maximizes his Hamiltonian for UR. So we are again taking the derivatives of UM and UR, but they should be between zero and one. And so we have some kind of a corner solution here, which we can find out. And these are the solution UM and UR. So given UM and UR, we go back, we get a VM, VR as well. So we have all four solutions. And then we have to solve simultaneously the PDEs, okay? So, so we, we put all of these into there, and because they're corner solution, there will be some regimes different regimes and we will solve all of them and eventually put them together. PM is the adjoint variable. We all know the adjoint variable is the first derivative of the value function. So we're gonna put the first, so here's your hamilton jacobi wellman equations for these two guys. This is the discounted equation. So this is a value function of the retailer. This is the value function of the manufacturer. And, and you can see that wherever was the adjoint variable, this PM, this PM will be substituted by V prime M and a PR will be substituted by V prime R. Once you put substitute that, then this become a differential equation, a system of differential equation, which we need to solve, okay? And we have a verification theorem that says that if you can solve this particular system, then that gives you an equilibrium, okay? So we're gonna solve this in closed form, in almost closed form. So now we have a UM and a UR given, given by these conditions. And so this is this is all all done, and we are going to solve. So now the next thing is we're going to devote solving this system. Now, what did Sethi did in 1983? I derived, I decided that I will try to look for a linear solution. And I I fudged the equation some way so the linear solution was the solution of this problem. And so that happens because of the quadratic nature of the cost function and all of that. That happens. Okay. So I have, a, I have a linear value function like this. And once I substitute the linear value function because I can have a VR and a VR prime, I can substitute all of these guys there in this one. So once I guess my value function, I can reduce the system of equation into system of algebraic equations for each setting. So the first setting is that one where beta, R, beta M is less than beta R divided by two. I have a UM equal to zero, which means no participation support by manufacturer and some support by the retailer, okay? And for that, these are the equation for, remember we, had it, we need to solve for AR, beta R, AM and beta M. We need four variables and these are the algebraic equation in four variables, okay? If you have, if you have the next setting, oh, sorry. If you have this setting, then UM and UR are both internal they are between, strictly between zero and one. And I have a set of equations again that can be solved. We're gonna put them together eventually, but for each setting, we can solve this. Again, for this one, there is no, there is no, no, no participation by retailer, but there is by UM. And again, there are these equations. All of these equations, some can be solved explicitly, but you know, algebraic equations are a difficult thing to solve. Even a single equation, if I give you square root of X, plus sine of x equal to zero, you don't know how to solve that equation explicitly. So there is no way we can solve any kind of complicated equation explicitly, but they can all be solved numerically as long as they are less than four, four or five powers, okay? So these are all by quadratic or cubic equations, which have a closed form solutions, but, but the solution sometimes has, because of the simultaneous, we, we do a numerical solution. So for numerical solution, I introduced one more term that has been introduced by us earlier in other papers. Uh, again, it's a SEPI model extended, and that means there's an interactive term also affecting the, the sales. So that's just more general than what we gave the previous time. And all of that equation can be transformed into this one. So the, I can derive new equation for this setting, and they are, they are not difficult to do. They're only differentiating the system. So here are the results. As you can see, when we put all these together and we have some parameters here, you can see that this is the manufacturer's revenue, or manufacturer's uh, uh, revenue for each unit of market, market, each unit of market share. 
then as M increases, that means his portion of the revenue increases, he will support more and more of the retailer's advertising because it is in his interest to earn more by selling more. You can see that up to about M equal to 0.6 or so, 0.7 or so, no support is given by the manufacturer. And after, so that's a different regime. And then that regime changes to this regime where manufacturer is actually supporting the retailer, okay? As you can also see as, as manufacturer, as manufacturer uh, M increases, retailers support to the manufacturer goes down. And at some point it goes to zero. It says, why would I support the manufacturer's advertising if manufacturer has so much high M that he's going to do any way he's advertising without my support. So why should I support it? So you are actually become zero. So that's sort of the idea here. Uh, and you can see that you are become zero when M is bigger than bigger than R. And when R is bigger than bigger than M, you are equal to zero, okay? By the way, this, this was a typo yesterday and I changed that typo only yesterday and, and corrected it, okay. Because of that, because they are supporting each other, one could ask what is the net net support given by the by by one to the other so you can sort of see here that when r and m equal to one the net support is zero and when r is here when m is low then the net support goes this is negative as you can see that is the net money transfer from the manufacturer to the retailer so here the retailer is transferring money to the manufacturer here the manufacturer is transferring the money to the retailer so we can find out the net transfer so you can see that the net transfer, which is, which, is, which is actually given, divided by one minus X, which is the remaining market share. We can see that as M increases, manufacturers incentive increases and the net transfer from manufacturer retailer increases. Vice versa, when M is bigger than R, net transfer is from manufacturer retailer and it's other way around when M is less than R. So I am just about done in time it's one minute one minute extra in the gun it's okay, so it's okay. The paper. Uh, uh, there, there's a difference between Nash and Stekelberg game we, we talked about that in a very simple setting we gave you two types of equilibrium and a two-period supply chain we gave you a, the general definition of a multi-period feedback that definition can be generalized to continuous time and it's in my 2019 paper we presented two papers uh, results in, from two different papers where we apply this theory of Stekelberg equilibrium. One was a revenue sharing contract. We gave a revenue sharing contract explicitly, was the first time given in a two period setting in the supply chain literature. So it's a, it's a seminal paper in, in supply chain management. Uh, corporate advertising is a seminal paper because this is the first paper on mixed game with the feedback Stekelberg and it was published in Siam Control. And so that concludes the paper. There are some of the references here that are this, by the way, uh, uh, Professor Virovich, if you would like, these transferences will be, can be made available to you guys. Uh, there's no, nothing proprietary here. Um, oh, nice, nice, yeah. yeah, so, so you, you can work with my Kushali to, to get those things. Mm -hmm. And I thank you. And if you have questions, you can ask me now, or you can email those questions to me. My email is right now sitting here and I, we can have a, we have a conversation, but but uh, um, if if you don't have any conversation, then I thank you for listening, and I hope that you have a great evening. And wherever you are, <laughs> we will have a great day. So so thank you once again. Um, so I I'm done uh, in time. I hope that uh, you enjoyed the talk. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I think uh, all of us, we enjoyed learning something related to uh, those kind of games uh, in, in the case of dynamic, actually, supply chains. And uh, maybe now is uh, time as it is <laughs> currently on the screen. Yeah. Uh, some questions, comments, uh, okay. Do we have any question, comments? I would like to ask a question, Mr. Chair, if you allow me. Of course, please. <laughs> okay, uh, first I have, uh, I want to ask um, 
uh, Professor Sassi, uh, is this uh, assumption uh, that the supplier and retailer always want to maximize prof profit, is that assumption always valid? Maybe they could be satisfied with a certain profit without maximization. And then uh, another question, uh, do, um, are, are these uh, results applied uh, in practice? I mean, uh, are uh, a huge uh, manufacturer or supplier or retailer aware of the results obtained by Professor Sethi and do they apply them? Okay, so the answer to the first question is that certainly there is a literature on uh, going back all the way to Herbert Simon that if you were to, you know, it, the, the issue of maximizing the profit comes to a question of what is rationality. And if you go back all the way to Simon's work, they're saying that the rational people need to know everything and uh, there's no way uh, in the world that we know everything. So the idea then is to do what is called satisficing. The satisficing is an idea that says that what I do is something that is a satisfactory solution for me, okay? So, 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 so clearly in businesses, uh, maximizing profit is certainly the most important objective. Uh, but if, if you're a growing company, maybe sometimes they maximize sales, for example. But regardless, that, that theory that I presented has nothing to do with the maximizers and the profit. You can define any utility that you want, whatever you want to maximize, you can define that. And then this, this whole, whole theory goes through, okay? So I'm only doing the maximum profit here, but you can maximize any objective function you want. So the, the Stekelberg game theory does not require, it requires an objective function to maximize, whatever that is. But if you don't maximize, then, 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 then it's a different thing altogether, okay? Then you go into satisficing and whatever. In terms of whether they are applied, certainly revenue sharing contract is often used in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the literature, in, in the practice. Uh, that is a contract that people use. Another contract which is equivalent is called buyback. And what happens is that the, the reason is that when you have a decentralized decision making, then the retailer basically, what happens is that the retailer doesn't take too much risk. So think about a book selling example. The bookstore will buy the books from the from the book step, book step, book book people, and 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 there is a, the demand is stochastic, so he might not buy enough. So then there's a contract called buyback contract, which is similar to revenue sharing contract. Sometimes they are equivalent. Buyback contract says that if if retailer cannot sell the book, then the supplier will buy the book back at some price called buyback price. So if the if the book is $100, the supplier says, okay, whatever you don't sell, I'll buy it back for $40. So because it buys back for $40, the supply, retailer will order more. And if the buyback price is set properly, then the retailer will order exactly what would be optimal for the total supply chain. So that is a coordinating buyback contract. And a buyback contract is very common in, 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 in many, of these, many of these companies because people, people will like to sell things uh, and, and it's, it's optimal for the manufacturer to buy things back because then the retailer will order more. So, and, and, and it'll be, otherwise the sales will be lost because the retailer doesn't have enough goods to sell and the sale will be lost. So that's true. The third thing that I want to mention is that there's a whole lot, whole lot of literature right now in something called asymmetric information where the retailer and supplier has different set of information. And that theory now is a principal agent problem or it's also mechanism design. And in the mechanism design, there is something called the revelation principle, which says that we only limit ourselves to what is called a truth telling, truth -telling contracts. It's, it's, it's a Nobel Prize winner, Meyerson, who got the Nobel Prize for Revelation principle turns out that the revolution principle holds only for static problems. If you do dynamic problems, it will hold for open loop problems because open loop problems are single period problems. But anytime you do feedback, which is a multi period problem, 
which means in, in economics we call them a short-term problems or short-term contracts. The revolution principle doesn't hold. And so the problem is still open as to what to do when the revolution principle doesn't hold because then people can lie and people can lie. Whereas in the revolution principle, we can show that you can limit yourself to truth telling contracts. And if you can lie, the mechanism will lie for you. So you don't have to lie. But, but when the revolution principle doesn't hold, certainly you can, you can do that. And, and my argument is that uh, Putin, had an, uh, Putin had a contract not to go to Ukraine, but he did not follow that. He went to Ukraine anyway. So, 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 so people, people don't own their contracts. And, and so, so that problem is wide open as to what is the nature of the solution when people can have different information and some people don't provide that information to you, even though they have them. And so how do you, how do you, how, how do you set up this kind of, and that problem is wide open by the way. I'm, I'm working on a two period setting on a simpler setting to see what to do. Uh, but it is given without the revolution principle, the problem becomes very difficult. Anyway, so that's kind of a long answer to a short question. Yes, you, yes, you did. Thank you very much. Other questions, comments? Okay, uh, then maybe I can ask you something. Uh, you mentioned in the, in the first part of your presentation about uh, the concept of uh, where manufacturer is leader and retailer is a follower, if I remember well. And uh, is it uh, some kind of, uh, or uh, can we understand this as a, some kind of a push kind, push type of a supply chain? This is the first part of the question. And uh, what if uh, we have a different type of supply chain, some kind of pool uh, type of a supply chain in, in uh, that case, we uh, manufacturing should produce accordingly to uh, some uh, defined demand, uh, which is given by, by a retailer or customer. And uh, if it is uh, corresponding to your uh, concept, uh, okay, in, in case when we produce something uh, which is uh, related to customer demand, yeah, it seems to be determinative, but it is not because we have different distortions because customers want more than it is actually necessary they need as a uh, with epic. So, uh, is this concept uh, applicable in, in this case, uh, if I understood well, if there is a, some correspondence between uh, uh, when manufacturer is leader to push and uh, on the other side, we have pull concept, uh, can we uh, make similar uh, uh, concepts or uh, models? To define. I don't think there is any problem of extending mathematics to these kind of things. I mean, there are push and pull contracts in the literature, but in the literature it's all single period problem. So when you do a multi period problem, you have to figure out, you know, what, so, so what happens is, I, I want to make a distinction between something here. There is a literature on multi period problem before my paper, but it's called multi-stage. So what happens is that you, the demand still happens at the very end of this. So if there are, let's say two periods, the demand happens only at the end of two periods. There's no demand at the end of the first period. So what you do is you produce in the first period, you build some inventory, you produce in the second period and you meet the demand, okay? Mm -hmm. That is still not a dynamic problem. The dynamic problem is that the demand materializes in each period and you have a new information in each period that you must take into account. And so the idea is that how you take into account this new information and that's where with the, so, so you, have a, you have a choice. You, you can do uh, any other kind of equilibrium and not take that into account or you take that into account and give up some of the features uh, that, that, are, uh, that are associated with that in the sense that you play the game at each point in time or in each period rather than play a long game. But then those problems are rather not solvable. So there's something called a closed loop equilibrium, 
the closed loop equilibrium means that you are you are you are you are deciding on the basis of the entire past information remember it's a game setting now so 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 you cannot say the things are kind of Markovian, you need to take into account all of the decision taken by the other guys and your guys and your decision that depends on the entire history. So if it depends on the entire history, you can still develop the theory of Sekelberg equilibrium, but it is, it is almost impossible to solve the problem. So there are, there, in my 2015 paper, we talk about some of those things. So the question now becomes, as long as you can formulate the problem in this setting, in a feedback equilibrium setting, we have a hope of solving the problem. You can always solve, create a problem that you don't know how to solve. You can still define the, the, the concept can be defined, but the, but the equations are impossible to solve. They become not tractable. Yep. So that's my answer at this point, rather than being more specific to this uh, particular scenario. But I think that as long as you can define the dynamics, uh, as long as you can define the problem in this setting, this setting. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, only thing that limits here is the following. Mm -hmm. I have a, this can be completely general. That is called a state equation. It yeah. is the equation that is, happens as a differential equation in, in control theory, and it's a, it's a difference equation in a discrete setting. So it is a completely general, this F is, there's no restriction in this F, as long as, as long as the differential equation has solution, you have to put some Lipschitz conditions and things like that. But other than that, you don't need anything. And then the, you can see the, the objective function is totally general. I don't say profit here. You, this is just some function of everything that you have. But, but you can see it, it's everything in that period and there's a summation. So it is not a function of the entire path. It is a function of each period and you sum it. That is important, otherwise, you can, otherwise it's a, it's a, it is a, it, the otherwise it is not a dynamic programming anymore, mm -hmm. right? Because it's a functional, that becomes a calculus of variation problem. And the calculus of variation problem, you know, is not time consistent and is, a, is not exactly easy to solve. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, do we have more questions, comments? Then uh, please, you can send me uh, on email as well if you have a questions. And those papers are yeah, available of course, of uh, course. to everyone. I can send of those course. papers to you. Of course. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your this presentation. Is the, this, is the, this is the paper, so just really quickly. This is the Siam Journal of Control paper. Uh, just one second. And only we can... We can <laughs> hold. Yeah, you can, you can. I can have uh, Kushali send that paper to you. So this is the Siam Journal of Control paper. Okay, okay. Uh, and, and the other one is also available. This is the Yeah, Palm that's paper. me. Um, I have a question for Professor Seti. Uh -huh. I wonder if you analyze the um, shapely value in your research. No, we don't. Okay, <laughs> shame, thank you. No, the, the reason is that we, we get into Steckelberg now. And so, um, there's a, there's a hierarchical structure here. Every supply chain has a hierarchy. There's a leader and a follower. So we don't get into, the Nash is gone. And, and uh, although, although if you look at this particular problem, you see this, is a, this, is a, this part is a Steckelberg, vertical one. But each, each of that horizontal part is a Nash, right? Because there, there's a competition going on between these two and these two. So that's, a, that's, that's why you call it Nash, Sekelberg Nash equilibrium, because there's a Nash component to it as well. But that's, that is at each point in time, each point in time they play Nash. Okay. Um, no, no, we don't, we, this, is, this is really connected to supply chain. And so we are not looking at the game theory in general, we're just looking at the Sekelberg problem and how to make that into dynamic setting. And, okay. and, and, and I'm proposing that the feedback setting is the right setting, even though you have a stage-wise mover, the first mover advantage. But if I can do a coordinating contract, it doesn't matter anymore, because because the best I can do is the centralized solution, which is dynamic programming, straightforward dynamic programming, and I cannot do anything better than that. So if I can manage to do a 
co coordinating contract, then with the feedback settlement. Notice now, if I do open loop, then the, the centralized solution is dynamic programming. And open loop is, decentralized open loop is not time consistent. So when I put a contract, that open loop has to become time consistent. And we have not looked at it. We have not looked at what if the decentralized problem is not feedback and how to coordinate that. Maybe coordination is not possible because in the end, the coordination requires you to go back to dynamic programming, which is time consistent. See, centralized problem is always time consistent. So, so we are now saying that the feedback stackable is the only game in town if you want a coordinating contract in this setting. So whatever you lose in the feedback cycle, but you gain, regain by coordinating contract. So that you don't have to worry about it. So that's my spiel on this supply chain setting, right? Okay, thank you. So um, once again, uh, uh, I hope to see you all in person. Maybe next year, this conference, we will be yeah. after the, is it every year conference? Is it every year? Uh, yeah, every year, every year. But so please, uh, uh, Millerard, please keep me uh, keep me in the loop yeah. on the next year, and I hope to see you then. Every at that year, time. but uh, we are not uh, organizers every year. We change organizers every year, so there are several institutions. But it's okay. We can we can invite you. This is the first thing. Another is maybe even is uh, before the OR conference hour. Maybe we will see yeah, <laughs> with yeah, COVID, sure. but uh, in, in May, some, I think uh, second half of May, we have also our logistics conference. Okay, okay. We will, we will see, but now yeah, we don't yeah. know uh, how is going on with, with the COVID and so on, but we will see. Only right, well, I, I think uh, as far as the US is concerned, we are such a big mess that we would we believe that I think within a year, at least a year, there should not, there would not be much of a possibility to travel. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the case right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Thank okay. you very much again. So, thank you again. Thank you. And bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.